1984 in Vancouver. The wooden freighter, the Robert Kerr, was wrecked and had to be towed into Burrard Inlet. On board was a man who was about to make one of the greatest impacts on the city any resident ever had. His name, Seraphin Fortes, but you may know him as Joe. I think one of the interesting things about Joe is that he was actually here before the city was actually the city. And so I think for many people in Vancouver, he was just that ever-present presence in terms of, oh yeah, there's Joe. Joe lived through the city's inception in the Great Fire of 1886 that completely destroyed Vancouver in only 20 minutes. Everything you read about him, he seems like a really nice guy that you'd want to actually know. And I think that's also interesting for the city because at this time, we're still not the most open society. And yet here you have this big black guy that's the friend of everybody. Joe became a barman at the Bodega Saloon, which stood here at the corner of Carroll and Cordova Streets. The patrons of the bar took to calling Seraph and Fortes Old Black Joe after a song that was popular in the city at the time. You know, moving on after his bartending career over to, to the beach and becoming the unofficial lifeguard, he's just sort of that big father figure for the city. Joe devoted all his spare time teaching young children to swim. He gripped the backs of their cotton bathing suits with his fist and was reported to say with a deep, mellow voice, kick your feet, child, kick your feet. Though as he touched generations, um, he taught, uh, you know, two, three generations of kids how to swim as being the sort of unofficial lifeguard of, of English Bay. So I think having that longevity in the city, um, but also just teaching generations of kids, you get that real attachment to him. The greatest thing and compliment to him was that there was just stay with Joe, you know, like just stay with him. And, and so there was complete trust. There was that sense of the kids are at the beach and I've got to go do stuff and Joe's there so they're going to be okay. Apparently he hosted uh, picnic, picnickers and uh, chaperone courting couples and uh, basically kind of kept the area free of unsavory characters back in the day. He exemplified hospitality, and that's really our uh, philosophy here at the restaurant. It's service can be defined as black and white, but hospitality is color. Joe lived here on the beach in a tent across the street from what is now the Sylvia Hotel. He cobbled together a few supplies, and that tent turned into a shanty. And just before World War I, the city of Vancouver was burning down all the shacks in an effort to clean up the beach. When city workers got to Joe's shack, they were met by hundreds of supporters that surrounding the house demanding to leave their beloved Joe's home alone. So the mayor acquiesced. The city ultimately lifted up Joe's house onto a wagon and moved it two blocks down the street. To here in what is now Alexandria Park at the foot of Bidwell Street. There's a drinking fountain that marks the spot where Joe spent the rest of his life looking out at the beach he loved. On the fountain, the inscription, little children loved him. In February of 1922, Joe died of pneumonia here at Vancouver General Hospital. The city was devastated. Uh, when you've had such a fixture in the city and a larger than life character, quite literally larger than life, um, the fact that when he dies, it's just a, a, such a huge outpouring of civic grief. There is this real sense of loss and the parade is still reckoned to be one of the largest ever uh, for his funeral. The irony is his gravestone at Mountain View is an incredibly simple little plaque that just says Joe. And so he lived simply, he died in a grand manner, but he's buried simply as well. His gravestone didn't have a last name. It didn't need one. That's because back then, everyone knew who he was. Michael Popov in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine.